Hey guys, John Ptolemy here with another in our long interview series. And today we have uh, Justin Hewn, who's also known as Uranium Insider on Twitter. And uh, just as a uh, trivia point, uh, Justin was the first guest on the interview series. And that was back in December of last year. So lots of things have happened in the Uranium space in the ensuing nine months. So we would wanted to have Justin back on and uh, talk about uh, what he's seen in the uranium market because uh, as always there's such a thirst for knowledge and uh, views on this uh, but uh, welcome on board Justin Hewn. Hey John uh, really great to chat with you again. So last time we talked uh, I think the uranium price was slightly lower uh, but you know, some of the same things that uh, I've been talking about for, it seems like a while, well, several years, supply, demand uh, around uranium, the low price, not incentivizing new production, and the continued growth of uh, reactors builds around the world continues, but the uranium price seems to be in stasis. So what I thought we'd do is just kind of kick this off talking about uh, just your general sense of what you're seeing in the market and then kind of maybe drill down into the supply demand situation and what you are looking for as catalysts that may turn this thing and get it start moving. So uh, what, what are you seeing right now? What's your general view right now in the uranium market? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, just kind of an overview, I guess, huh? Um, yeah. Um, I yeah I think that you you put it pretty accurately that the, that the price is kind of in stasis right now. Um, the summertime is usually typically a pretty slow period um, for uranium. One exception was in 2018 after um, Cameco put MacArthur River on permanent care and maintenance, which was July. We had some pretty substantial spot market activity after that, um, which we can presume traders and and utilities were scrambling for a bit of spot market pounds after that announcement. But generally speaking, the summer is quite slow. Um, you know, a lot of uh, utility fuel buyers are on vacation. They're taking their time. Um, not only that, we have, uh, it's towards the end of the fiscal year. The beginning of the fiscal year for U.S. utilities is October 1st. And so a lot of times in a normal year, in a non-COVID year, we have um, W&A conference in person in September. It'll be virtual this year. And then there's also a, a uh, what is it the, the fuel the fuel buying conference I'm, I'm forgetting the name right now that typically happens every October um, so both of those will be virtual this year which changes things a little bit but um, yeah so the spot market it's been you know it's been slowly kind of dripping down for the past six weeks or so with very very minimal activity which is kind of a good sign I think if you were to see high volume trades happening on the spot market and a declining price that would be a little bit concerning but we're talking really, really small volumes here. And a lot of what we've seen actually is um, the, 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 the price discrepancy between delivery location. So there's three primary conversion facilities where uranium is traded. That's Cameco, Comurex, and Converdine. And Cameco, uh, the Port Hope facility, is, um, is kind of been at a premium, uh, about a, a, almost a 10% premium to the other locations. And for whatever reason, that that location difference has been has been closing in price. So there could be some some arbitrage with um, uh, moving pounds from here to there to take advantage of that price difference. But really, the spot market is essentially dead right now. It's very very low volume trades, and the price is slipping down a bit. I'm not concerned whatsoever. Um, but gosh, yeah, a lot has changed since we talked in December. <laughs> December was kind of a little bit of a dark time because we had a lot of tax loss selling uh, with 2019 not being a very good year for uranium overall. We didn't really see, um, well, for the uranium markets, I should say, um, we didn't really see seasonality last year, which we typically see, you know, every three out of four years, we'll see a pretty substantial seasonality, cyclical movements with the uranium stocks and with a spot price to some extent. So usually that's the Q4, things tick up a bit. 
that probably has a lot to do with the fiscal year happening October 1st and, and the conferences I just mentioned. But we didn't have a lot of that last year. There wasn't much movement in price. Um, therefore, the stocks didn't move very much. And we had a lot of tax loss selling in December, followed by URA, the, the largest um, uranium ETF, which actually is only 70% at the time. It was reduced to 50% pure uranium holding. So URA was selling a lot in January, which just added insult to injury after the December tax loss selling. It was pretty pressing in January. Um, didn't get any better in February. Along comes COVID and March was just uh, painful all around. <laughs> so <clears throat> we had in a, in a we had uranium and of course um, uh, the broad markets tanking February, March uh, just took, well, that was, that was the, the, that was the death knell for, for the uranium stocks. And March 23rd, the absolute low um, was when Chemico announced that they'd be closing Cigar Lake out of concerns for COVID. And precaution and that pretty much was a v-shaped recovery um not only for the broad markets around that time but uranium just really started to move we saw substantial spot market action over the following let's say six weeks from there the uranium equities just completely reversed and it's been pretty strong since then um, with a couple of mild corrections but they generally seem to be pullbacks on an uptrend overall i think we're in an interesting place right now um, Still some concern over second wave potential for COVID to impact supply. I'm not expecting that. Some people are, um, but the potential is there. And again, we've just got a quiet spot market. So um, let me know if I'm rambling too much here. <laughs> There's, uh, I, I, I could just keep talking forever. If you have any points to interject or question, shoot. But um, I'm happy to keep going. Yeah. Um, so... We've kind of segued right into supply. So I think there was, I mean, one of the things I think people are looking at, and I think it's just a it's just a reflection of how opaque the market is. You really don't have the data. For example, if tomorrow in the oil market, and a market that's followed around the world, a, a, mar a market that has instantaneous news um, that the Saudis came out and said they were going to cut production in Saudi Arabia by 10 or 15%, uh, the oil price would immediately start rallying in world markets. I don't know how much it would go up, but it would go up significantly. And uh, But I think part of the issue with uranium is that the information, is, most of the trades are done um, on the spot market with traders or they're done between long-term uh, trades or contracts between utilities and mining companies or trading companies. And these things are not normally disclosed. There's usually NDAs around them. So the information flow on what is actually transpiring sometimes, I think, in the uranium market is, you know, it's just not good. So I think there's, you know, a lot of, at least my view or what I see is there's a lot of supposition or there's a lot of guesswork or there's a lot of analysis, depending on who you are and how deep you dive into it, that's required to try to figure out, okay, you know, if we're cutting all this mine production, if Kaz Adam Prom is not going to be increasing production, and in fact um, had a bunch of people off for COVID and couldn't drill new ISL wells, you know that's going to have an effect down the line, a knock-on effect. Why isn't this price of uranium moving up? I think that's what a lot of people kind of ask me in my conversations. It's like you have all this wind in your sails, all this positive news. But then I try to remind them that if you look at really where we came from, the price is up pretty, pretty decent. Uh, if you look, it depends what your time frame is and that these things do take time to get going, uh, these uh, resource bull markets. So can, can you speak a little bit to that? Uh, of, of I'm sure you hear it too, maybe from your subscribers or even from other folks that you talk with is like, okay, what is it really going to take to get this price really moving? And then, you know, because obviously, regardless of what anybody wants to say, the price of uranium is going to drive these uranium stocks. Or That's my view, at least. Comment on that? Yeah, all, all, all good questions, John. Um, I think, um, and I've certainly heard that as well, primarily from folks newer to the space on Twitter um, or to some extent, um, newsletter subscribers of mine who have asked similar questions. But um, we've actually seen the equities perform relatively well um, to compared to the price of the uranium. So 
over the past two months with, with the spot market kind of staying flat or slowly falling, um, the uranium market has really held up well relative to that because you're right, generally speaking, the equities do uh, follow that price of uranium. Um, but it's it's been pretty strong. I think we've seen some some institutional interest. We've seen more um, analysts reporting on uranium, um, discussing kind of more of the mid large cap stocks that have exposure, uh, the Cameco's, the next gen, et cetera, um, putting out price targets, putting out commentary on the market overall. That's been a good sign. Um, I think that there's been increased exposure to the gold and silver markets. Precious metals investors seem to have uranium on their radar, maybe starting to take some profits from what's been a really strong precious metals market since March. And obviously before that was pretty good as well. Um, so I think we're seeing some of that, but, but you're right. Um, generally speaking, the, the uranium market, when it comes to the fuel cycle, utilities, buyers and sellers, spot, mar spot market, term market, it relax, reacts a little bit slower to, to this news, um, particularly with the news from Kazatomprom. So Kazatomprom announced, as you mentioned, that they shut down their, their well field development for their ISR mines in April, um, just a couple of weeks after Cigar Lake uh, was shut down for similar reasons for, due to COVID. And we did see some spot market activity following that, but I don't think the real impacts of that are very well understood by um, most of the investing community. And I think that I can try to clear some of that up um, from what I'm seeing. And I believe that this is actually a really good example why things don't move in lockstep with news, especially in this market. So you mentioned the oil market and, and other markets like that have much faster reactions from the market, from not only the price of oil, let's say, um, but in the stocks as well. I mean, it all just moves immediately on news. And sometimes that happens with news in the, in the uranium market, but a lot of times it's just so darn forward looking um, and, and the impacts are so far out into the future that the market doesn't really know what to make of it. So I think I'll, I'll try to describe in layman's terms what I'm sort of seeing um, in, the, in the general uranium market, in particular with Kazatomprom being the, the largest uranium producer in the world. Um, and they have an, a number of JVs that are also beginning to see impacts from COVID. <clears throat> so they recently had a conference call at the end of, of August and they had uh, they put out a really fantastic um, slide deck with that conference call. And there was one slide in that deck that showed visually the timeline for the development and production of one of their ISR wells. So they have these really huge deposits. Um, so ISR, if just for your listeners that might not be familiar, in situ recovery. So that's actually recovering uranium from underground with actu without actually disturbing the surface of the ground, without you know drilling, uh, uh, developing an underground mine or an open pit mine. It's mineralization that's held typically within an aquifer below ground um, in an ore body. And so the way that it's extracted is they, they inject solution into injection wells. They, instru they extract it from extraction wells. The solution in this case is sulfuric acid. And the acid is injected into the aquifer and it's extracted through the, through the other wells, through the extraction wells, um, having interacted with, with the uranium. Um, that concentrate is extracted then processed. And so <clears throat> this graph that I'm talking about describes that the process of drilling and, um, and, and establishing the piping in the injection wells and ex in establishing the extraction wells takes about five to eight months before they can even start that first injection of sulfuric acid and extraction um, and, and a mineralized uh, uh, concentrate. So that five to eight month period. So what I'm seeing right now, that process stopped in April. And, but what happened during that stoppage is the established well fields continued fluid flow because that is the process that's, the, that's not all that labor intensive relative to the drilling and establishing of these well fields. So their production continued. And we actually saw from their Q1, Q2 production, there was barely any 
any drop in Q2 production for them. Also for Uranium One, which just put out their their first half of the year report as well. Uranium One has, I believe, three or four JV projects with uh, Kazatomprom, and it's their primary production um, in Kazakhstan for Uranium One with those JVs. So during the stoppage from April to August, there's a four-month period, they continue to produce through those existing well fields. But the, the stoppage, okay, so now after four months, they're currently getting back into well field development. So we're talking five to eight months. So we'll go August, September, October, November, December. That's five months is December. December is the beginning of winter. And Kazakhstan has extremely cold winters. And if you dig into their data from past reports, you can find the drilling data, the, the well field development data. And the three slowest months for them are January, February, and December in that order. And so essentially, and what they've said, Riaz Rizvi in his interview with, um, with Matthew Gordon on, on Crux Investor a couple months back is a fantastic interview as well. He mentioned that they just cannot, they cannot do the injection work of the sulfuric acid in that, in that weather when the temperatures are, what was it, minus, minus 20, minus 30 plus Celsius. It's just too cold. They, they can't do it. So what I'm seeing is the well field development that is beginning now is, will be ready for acidification right when winter hits. So I honestly don't believe there's going to be substantial acidification of the work they're doing now until after the winter. They might be able to do a little bit, but really what we're seeing is a, an incredible delay in production for them. And because of the lag time that you mentioned um, in general in this market and in particular with this situation, they're going to start to see the impacts of uh, with production loss in the next quarter and, and big time in 2021. But they have yet to really guide for that. So they guided for 4,000 tons of lost production in 2020, which is about 10 million pounds, 10.4 million if I recall correctly. Um, for 2020, that's what they're expecting this year, but they're guiding for normal production next year. And I don't think they yet are ready to to call what they're what they're expecting in production losses. But I can guarantee you there will be some. It's an interesting situation. And I'm not calling for Armageddon here, but I am saying that because Adam Prom, they're going to be fine. They're going to have to buy some pounds in the spot market, and they've already they've already have done that, and they already are guiding to do more of that. I don't think it's going to be huge volumes this year. Um, I don't think it might be huge volumes in general, but they will need to buy some uranium. But I think the bigger impacts are to their JV partners, primarily Uranium One and Orono. Orono already has uh, lost production from MacArthur River, lost production from Cigar, um, which is being restarted at the moment, but they've got six months of lost production from Cigar being offline. Um, and then they also have a uh, common mine in Niger, which will be shuttering in the first quarter of next, uh, of next year. So their JV projects, um, primarily CATCO in, uh, in Kazakh, in Kazakhstan with Kazatomprom is going to have some pretty substantial impacts next year as well. And the reason I believe uranium one and Orono's impacts from their, from their Kazatomprom JVs are more important to the market is because because Adam Prom is not a spot market seller, and they've even stated that they won't be won't be dealing directly with traders. But Uranium One and Orono are historically pretty substantial spot market sellers. So it's what I'm seeing is an increased impact to production in 2021, especially the first half of 2021, and a very thin spot market. Um, with the need of Cameco and Kazata Prompt to be buying pounds um, from the spot market. And that's not even to say what potential um, volume might come from utilities when they do come back into the market in any reasonable uh, scale. Let me, um, let me jump in here and ask you a question because uh, just listening to you brought up a couple questions that I had. Uh, the first one is that when we're talking about the spot market, and the supply to the spot market. Um, I've heard the argument made by several folks that we're really not going to see any big movements um, because 
people that are fuel buyers are holding back. Uh, let me just give you the, the theory. So I'm a fuel buyer at Duke, for example. And I go to my boss and I say, hey, you know, we have to, uh, we have this, you know, there's a, the Python that the thing has to go through from mine to, you know, for the outage, for the refueling, for the reactor being whatever it is, 18 months, two years, whatever it is. So we need to get lined up for this. And then you go and say, well, you know, Cameco's offering us this long-term contract uh, to supply these three reactors for, you know, the next 10 years at, you know, 45 or $48 a pound or whatever. I'm just making these numbers up. And then, the, you know, the boss says, well, why would we do that? We can go to the spot market. There's plenty of material in the spot market. The price is $30, $31, nothing doesn't seem to ever change. Why, why do we need to go make a long-term contract with Cameco? Is that some of the thinking uh, from the fuel buyer's perspective? I mean, I, I think these people are smart and savvy people. I used to work at Duke Energy, not in the nuclear division, but uh, we had a lot of smart people there. Uh, but there is a certain amount of bureaucracy also. So is is that a concern? Is that something that's really out there? I've heard that argument made before. For sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I agree with you. I think generally speaking, fuel buyers are, are pretty sharp and, they, and they're very uh, savvy with what's going on with the market. Um, I think some of them are just phoning it in and waiting to see um, what the big boys do, what the Dukes and the Exelons do as far as term contracting goes. But uh, yeah, the trend over the over the past five years or so has been um, more uh, short and midterm contracts and carry trades, which essentially a carry trade is uh, you know a trader selling uranium to um, to a utility and then acquiring it elsewhere, sometimes from the spot market, sometimes from off takes from producers, um, and they're they're basically tacking on a small a small profit onto that trade and they're they're, they're they've done a, a really substantial job of cleaning up a lot of mobile inventory that was around from from oversupply from the middle of the last decade so carry traders kind of get a bad rap and they've had a huge impact on um the lack of term contracting long-term contracting for some of the big producers uh primarily chemical <clears throat> so they certainly have had a negative impact on on the producers, but um, the the carry trade has done a lot to 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 clean up that excess mobile inventory that's been around from the oversupply. Um, but I, I totally agree with you. I don't think utilities are going to come to the market in any substantial volume for term contracting until they have to. That's kind of my thinking on it. And so it's relatively quiet right now out there. And I believe going forward, any utilities that do need to top up and do need to secure fuel for the coming years are going to attempt to get that in short and midterm carry trades um, to the extent that they can. And I believe that that is going to need to either A, drive up the price because mobile inventory uh, we believe has fallen so much that that carry trades going forward are going to have to access uh, the majority of the pounds from the spot market, which will move the spot price up. Um, or to the extent that those trades just aren't available, that once short midterm contracts are not of substantial volume enough to fill the needs of some of these utilities, then I think they'll be forced back into the term market, into mid and long term contracts with the likes of Camago. Adam Prom, et cetera, Orono, um, Uranium One, even both of those entities also um, engage in, in long-term contracts. So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting place to be with the market being as quiet as it as it is with all of this news around the production impacts from COVID um, that we expect. Why isn't the price moving? Well, that's kind of why we the producers have been the big buyers this year. Um, and that's that will have to change eventually. And it's just one of those markets where it's so damn hard to time exactly when things move. But when they do, they move so hard that my my strategy and the strategy that I've uh, tried to um, encourage my newsletter subscribers to do is, is just just slowly accumulate, buy in multiple tranches, you know, find and recognize um, the the best companies to invest in, which I think we've done a pretty good job in in uh in picking and when those are weak due to the broad market influence or whatever it might be just scoop up a little bit more 
just slowly build out those positions because when it moves, it really, really moves, but it's just so hard to say when. All of that said, <clears throat> we have some really important overhangs in the coming few months um, with some potential volatility from the broad markets, primarily from the U.S. presidential election um, early November. But that is one of the overhangs is the presidential election. Um, there's a number of U.S. utilities that, let's say, have um, uncertain futures, uh, not necessarily due to the president, which president will be elected, but um, the parties that support. So generally speaking, the Republican Party, Donald Trump um, as president and the Department of Energy that currently exists is very, very supportive of nuclear. They want to grow nuclear. They want new builds. They want new exports. They want to encourage and support the development of SMRs, small modular reactors, which is really gaining a lot of speed and looking very positive for the future. Um, the Democrats have only recently changed their tune um, and stated that they're in support of nuclear, but it's so fresh that I think there's still a lot of uncertainty for the U.S. nuclear um, industry with the potential of a, of a, of a change in, in leadership um, from Republican to Democrat. So that's a big overhang. The other big one is the, is the Russian suspension agreement, which we're expecting news on or before October 4th. Uh, that expires at the end of this year, and there, it's unknown whether or not that will be uh, reestablished, whether it will be, um, whether the 20% quota that's currently allowed will be constrained to a smaller amount, whether it will be increased. It's a really big overhang. And so I'm no doubt many utilities are waiting to, for clarity on both of those items before coming back into the market in any substantial matter. So I sort of see the remainder of the year as being continued opportunity for accumulation with the potential of a couple of these catalysts clearing and causing some action in the spot market, uh, causing some, some upward pressure on the spot price, and we could see some the equities moving. But I also see a lot of potential for broad market volatility surrounding the, the presidential election. It's, I feel like the broad market is overbought here in many ways, um, especially with overvalued tech stocks. They've kind of got hit this past week. but um, it's hard to believe that the Fed will allow it to fall very hard between now and the election, even though I totally think it should. Um, there's a lot of nefarious stuff going on around the election, and I think it could get messy following the election. If that's the case, I think that we'll see a lot of volatility. And in the case of a Biden win, I believe that the markets will not react positively. Um, I don't expect that. But um, it is possible, of course. So those are kind of some headwinds and what I'm seeing for the next few months. Um, I see strong potential for a very, very substantially um, strong moves in the, in the uranium market for 2021. And that's what we're positioning for with the potential of some moves between now and then. Excellent. Um, let, me, let me steer it back to Kaz Adam Prom for a second, just to ask one more question. I think... Mm -hmm something that a lot of people are missing and i hear this a lot too is that or at least i've noticed i mean they are the 800 pound gorilla the largest producer in the world and i think what i hear a lot of times is you know we talked about uh you know their issues with covid and the production um is going to lag a bit because of uh, uh some of the issues they had around their isr uh pipeline uh, that they need to stay on track to keep their production uh, consistent. I mean, these are, I try to remind people, this is an extractive industry. You have to continually, uh, you know, move your reserves into uh, resources and, and then produce them. So um, that is something people need to keep in mind. But the question I have, or the comment I have about, I'd like to get your comment on Kaz Adamprom. I've noticed over the last three three years or so, a definite shift in, the management, the communication from the management, what they're saying, um, they seem to be, they seem to have transitioned, maybe not fully, but it's definitely visible from my perspective, from this old Soviet state mindset of just crease, increasing production for the sake of increasing production because we have to meet the five-year plan to where you have these dynamic younger executives, they set up the trading arm, 
they have said on multiple occasions, now we have to watch what they do, but they have said on multiple occasions that this is a resource that is a uh, national treasure for Kazakhstan. Uh, it's very important to Kazakhstan. They're not just going to produce it at low prices, something similar that Geitzel has said at Cameco. And they just seem to have making more and more market orientated um, comments and, and and when they're interviewed or when they're even in their uh, presentations. And what I, I guess what I'm saying is, is, you know, one of the big things that I hear is that, well, you know, if the price moves up to 50 or $60 a pound in uranium, that Kazan and Prompt is going to flood the market with, um, with uranium. And we're just not going to see a big, uh, um, big move in uranium because they're just going to come in and just, you know, do do that. And I, and my argument is, is they don't need to do that uh, just because of the fact that they already have a substantial market share. They understand that it's a depleting resource and they want to maximize the return. They've moved away, like I said, from that state mindset to that more of a market mindset. Do you have a view on that? And can you uh, disabuse people of that particular canard if, if, if it's in fact uh, you share that view? Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, I do share that view. Um, I, I believe that uh, that they've really changed their tune. Um, and I think that the move that they've made with establishing uh, their trading arm, THK, uh, Trading House, because Adam Prom, the Swiss trading arm, with being uh, partially public, with paying a dividend, they're, they're now profit motivated rather than production motivated. Um, and uh, value over volume is the way that they put it. And so far, they've completely stuck to their word on that. So as of yet, we don't really have any reason to believe that they, that they have um, intentions otherwise. Uh, a couple other comments on <clears throat> not necessarily their interest in flooding the market, but simply their ability to flood the market. So you're absolutely right with, with you know, uranium production is an extractive industry, and especially with these ISR mines, these deposits. They have to continuously drill all the time because the decline rates are so substantial. Um, you can just imagine you have one well injecting uh, fluid and another well extracting fluid, uh, the distance between the two. You, there's only so much uranium you can pull out of that. And when you increase the production from newly drilled wells, it's a steep increase that takes about 18 months to the peak from the time when they first start drilling. So there's such a lag time between the initiation of, let's call it a ramp up of production to when that actually peaks. And from that peak at 18 months, it immediately starts declining. So you have a decline of four to 6% per month over two to three years. Uh, for a particular well field. Uh, so it takes time, it takes money, it takes employees. If you actually look at their reports, the number of employees for Kazatom Problem has dropped substantially, um, something to the tune of 20%, 25% over the past few years. It takes, and, and, and CapEx into well development has also fallen off a cliff. So there will not be, I can almost guarantee this, There's there will not be a substantial ramp in production in the next couple of years. It just cannot happen based on what they've done previously um, in the meantime to allow something like that to happen. With uranium at 50 to $60, will they make an effort to increase production? Yeah, I think they will. But again, that takes time, that takes money. It's not just flipping a switch and it's not something that will kill the market, quote unquote. Um, at least not in the short term. It would take multiple years to ramp up production. So if you look at, you go to the WNA website and look at historical data on how incredibly fast they were increasing production um, in the 2000s and the 2000 teens. Uh, every year that you see production increase, that was massive CapEx and drilling two years prior. So we're not seeing that CapEx being injected right now. We're not seeing a ramp up in drilling right now. We're not seeing a ramp up in employment right now. None of the data that we're seeing is pointing towards flooding the market within a time frame that would even be possible based on the lag time between um, development and production. So um, they, they certainly seem to be focusing on, on profit. Um, I believe they're really liking 
what they're seeing with uh, sales in the 30s compared to the 20s, especially with the amount that they produce. So I, I don't expect Kazatomprom to ever be a market killer. And if we see uranium in, in the 50 to 60 plus dollar a pound range, by that time, our investments are already at 5x, if not more. So it's kind of a good problem, even if that could happen, which it won't in the next couple of years, at least. So that's a that's a good segue into, um, I think, um, from supply into demand. You know, you mentioned SMRs. They're on the board. Many people are developing them around the world. I think it's going to be a fantastic uh, uh, development. I think it's going to probably start mostly probably in Russia and China and those places. Eventually, I believe it'll be adopted here in the United States and in Europe. But you mentioned something that uh, I'm starting to see more and more when you talked about the political views uh, towards nuclear energy of both parties. And you're right, uh, this administration is very pro-nuclear. Um, we've let our nuclear industry atrophy here in the United States, much to our detriment. This is unconscionable that we have 20% of our electricity in this country provided by nuclear power and we produce de minimis amounts of of uranium. We are in a very precarious situation. And I don't say that uh, uh, for hyperbole purposes. It's actually true. It's a national security issue. A large, our capital ships are mostly nuclear fueled. Um, it's just uh, ridiculous. Uh, what I would like to get into though is what I'm th seeing more and more of is I'm not seeing a slowdown. I'm seeing, you know, every time you mention the WA, I go on there, new nuclear. Okay, this reactor in the UAE just started. Uh, just went uh, commercial. One in a big reactor in China just went commercial. The recent five-year plan of the uh, Central Committee, they've increased the amount of reactors that China's going to build. One of the first homegrown reactors just came online. And these are big units. We're talking, you know, thousand plus megawatt units. And um, if you go down and look at the um, planning stages of nuclear that's coming online, I mean, the demand continues to increase. This fallacy or lack of understanding, you know, and focus, I think, home country bias. Well, we're not really building too many reactors in the U.S. and Europe is shutting theirs down in Germany. Kind of, you know, I think it came out last year. We finally now are producing more kilowatts from nuclear. Uh, we're making all-time records now with extensions, with upgrades, with new mm -hmm. units to compensate for Fukushima. So, or uh, and the shutdown in Japan. So, the growth is there. It's going to continue. And then what I also want to take note of was you, you are seeing the shift. I mean, it's anecdotal, I know, but you're starting to see it. You've seen even people as radical as AOC make positive comments now towards nuclear. Uh, Mike Schellenberger seems to have uh, convinced uh, <laughs> this spokesman for Extinction Rebellion in the UK, uh, Neon Light. She quit uh, Extinction Rebellion. She's a big nuclear advocate now. So people that um, I think are recognizing that if they feel that carbon is the thing that's going to endanger us, that in order to counteract that, you know, it's not going to happen from possibly just focus on solar and wind, that nuclear is going to be a big part of that. And I think from the emerging markets perspective or second tier countries, not first world countries, uh, they recognize they have to have a mixed generation, a mix in their generation and not just focus on one, you know, coal or, I mean, that's just good policy. So what what are your thoughts on that? I just don't, you know, what I'm trying to get to here is I just laid out a lot of positives. And one of the things that I get back at me is, is I'm always trying to figure out, like, what's the downside to this thing? I mean, and the only thing I can see right now on the demand side would be something like another nuclear accident on the scale of like a Chernobyl or Fukushima or something like that which would slow. It probably wouldn't kill it, probably kill it for a decade, but inevitably, unless we're going to go back to some agrarian-based society in, away from a technological industrial society, the, the power requirements are only going to be met via uh, large-scale thermal, and that's nuclear probably. So uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, a lot of good points. Um, <clears throat> it's... Um... I think that uh I mean just to 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 comment on the on the rhetoric coming from um from from the Democrats and the like the green green new deal kind of thing I think that they've been called out by the Schellenbergers of the world he's done an incredible job to advocate for nuclear probably more than anyone just just phenomenal um 
the rhetoric was so extreme uh, in with the Green New Deal. I mean, literally saying we have 10 years before it's absolute Armageddon, like the end of the world is coming in 10 years. And it's because of carbon emissions. Also, no nuclear. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, it's just you can't believe what they're saying because they're not utilizing the tools that are at their disposal to address the problem that they're stating is the problem. So it's either they don't actually believe that it's the problem and this is all some other agenda that's playing out with, with, with regard to carbon emissions, or they're just, just so alarmist about uh, nuclear waste or the potential for an accident that the best possible thing they can utilize to combat carbon emissions is just thrown out, thrown out the window. So they've really been called out on that, like I said, by, by Mike Schellenberger and other folks. And, uh, it does seem like they're changing their tune, which is fantastic um, because it's it's obvious. It's an obvious solution. If you think that carbon is the big problem, then nuclear is the only base load besides besides um, uh, hydro that's that's carbon free essentially. And uh, don't even want to go down the rabbit hole of of the impacts of of hydro, um, which. If you have, if you've done any sort of study into kind of environmental impacts, damming rivers is really, really not a good thing. But um, anywho, moving on from that, uh, Fukushima. The primary reason that Fukushima tanked the uranium market was because Japan shut off all of their reactors in short order following that. I believe it was 53 or 54 reactors. It was about 10% of, of global demand just got shut off immediately. Meanwhile, meanwhile, uranium production takes so long and so much money, and so much time and effort and permitting and, and everything to get into production that it's, you don't just switch it off. So production continued even after this demand was closed. And Germany, I think, followed suit uh, shortly thereafter. They closed about half, I believe, of their nuclear fleet. Um, only to expand on wind and solar, which essentially didn't work. Five hundred billion dollars of investment into wind and solar that now makes up a very small percentage of their of their grid, and they've had to expand coal production, um, coal uh, excuse me energy um, to make up for the lack of nuclear. So that was an abject failure. But that was the big reason. Fukushima obviously was for uh, global sentiment around nuclear was was terrible. Um, the accident itself caused zero deaths and um, uh, it has not really been that bad of an environmental um, disaster, but the, the influence it had on people's sentiment around nuclear has taken a long time to shift that back. And um, obviously the impacts to the, to the demand due to all the reactor closures. So yes, going forward into the future, the only things that I can really see that affect the story negatively would be an unexpected, um, an unexpected change in demand, uh, either existing demand or demand growth. So, you know, a big part of the story right now is China, and their expected massive increase. I believe it's a 50% increase in their in their nuclear generation in the next decade. Um, it, it could be even more than that. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it's a lot. So, if they all of a sudden say, "Yeah, we're not going to," we're we're kind of stopping our our nuclear expansion that would not be good for the market. doesn't seem like that's happening. In fact, we've seen news about um, uh, the, the first, um, I'm forgetting the name of the, of the power plant. It's the first of its kind that uh, is a thousand, I think it's 1100 megawatt um, that plant that was just connected to the grid and they've got many, many more planned. And they had a little bit of a slowdown. I think um, the whole world did with, with existing builds due to COVID, but it seems like that's getting back on track, especially in China. So I think that would be the biggest um, threat to this market would be an unexpected demand hit. Um, also, an unexpected increase in production or new production that comes from somewhere that we just don't see. Um, you know, these things are always possible. Uh, but as we're looking at it now, the picture looks fantastic for, for a growth in the industry, a growth in demand. You're right that just recently global uh, Nuclear energy production eclipsed the pre-Fukushima levels, so it's now at an all-time high in all of history, which is great. Um, it's it's a wonderful clean energy source, and it's an investment that 
I feel confident in. Um, I have my own money in, and it looks like we're in for a bright future um, for the coming years for this. I, I see this currently as a, maybe a three to four year investment, but you never know what can change. Um, something could slow down the growth and extend that. Something could, uh, a catalyst could happen that m- leads us to a price spike situation like the last bull market that makes it a shorter investment. Very difficult to predict, but overall the supply and demand situation is is resoundingly positive when it comes to an accretive price for uranium and uh, the corresponding stocks that we're investing in. So that kind of brings us to some concluding remarks. I would like to, um, I don't want to put you on the spot because uh, it's not good to make predictions, but I've always held the view just from my experience um, in extractive industries and understanding the cycles that they go through. And, you know, these things go through periods of underinvestment, which sets the stage for a price surge, uh, inevitable price surge for a required commodity, um, just because the lag time between when the price goes up and when um, capital can be mobilized and, and new production can be brought online. So these things can be tracked. What I think is unique to this particular market and I want to get your thoughts on this, is we have this artificial interruption of the cycle, if you will, uh, with the Fukushima situation. We had this tremendous amount of capital spent um, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, That's typical. The price went to 147 bucks, whatever it was, a pound. You had a tremendous amount of uh, capital come into this uh, particular market. Um, And then, you know, the price goes down over time because you get into the demand is sated uh, and then you get into underinvestment. The thing that's interesting for me is, is because of the accident, you basically put this thing in stasis, like in like in that, you know, deep freeze sleep for like 10 years. There has been we've been living off investments. Um, I think uh, Rick will use this term uh, for another industry, but I like to co-opt it for this. We're basically, um, the, the, the industry is in liquidation. The amount of investment that needs to happen in order for this to be new mines to come online to meet the forecast demand is not sufficient. Um, I think that is something that uh, is that people miss. And I, I think the, the consequence of that is going to be, once this thing gets going and people come to the market, because they're forced to, because you're not going to build a three or $4 billion plant, uh, you know, reactor, and then, you know, have to turn the thing off because the music stopped and there wasn't a chair available for you. So having smart people in this thing and knowing they know their timelines when their fuel outages are, I, I'm, I'm just of the opinion that, and especially with uranium, with the taint that it has, um, for example, I'll just use an example of one company that I that I follow, but I don't have any holding. I'm not saying anything good or bad about it, but there's just a lot of interest in a company in Spain, Berkeley, I think is the name of it. And they just had a heck of a time getting permits. I mean, who's going to let you open a uranium mine in a developed country? Uh, you're going to have a hard time doing that. And uh, I think just the timing and the price, the longer the price stays down at these levels, it's not incentivizing capital to come and build new mines and take that risk. And in order to get to the incentive price and then above it, in order to to incentivize people for a profit motive, I mean, the, the amount of time that's passed, um, I think is going to lead, uh, that, that dearth of new production has the potential to lead to a, a spike. And I don't like to put numbers on that, but I just have this, That's that's been my view all along. And I just think that this thing, industry has been just been in deep sleep for so many years. And, and, and it, this, because it is an extractive industry, uh, it's just not, uh, and a lot of the overhang and a lot of the bad news that's held, held the price back. Um, I think that uh, it's going to become recognized that, hey, there, there may not, there's plenty of uranium in the ground, but it takes more than a, you know, you can't just code overnight. Uh, a couple guys get on a computer and code up a new mine. It takes years of, uh, you know, development time and permitting and all the other things that go along with, with developing a mine, and especially probably uh, even more difficult with uranium. Uh, do you, I don't want to put you on the spot for a price or a timeline that's bad 
that's bad news making predictions about the future but uh um your thoughts on the potential for a you know a spike um i think that the potential for a spike grows as time passes um between where we are now and uh any substantial term contracting that would justify the uh, mines that are on care and maintenance to come back into some level of production. And that's primarily Cameco's MacArthur River and uh, Paladin's Langer Heinrich, which needs higher prices than MacArthur River. There is a decent amount of idled supply that can be incentivized in the 40 to $60 range. So I think what I'm sort of seeing are, are sort of two scenarios, which would be one, uh, contracting picks up next year and we see a, the price rise into the 40s. We see some term contracting start to happen. We see some idled production at least begin to be considered to be brought back online. Now, with MacArthur River, we have um, the first year. So we have 12 to 18 months of, of uh, probably closer to 12, in my opinion, um, to get them back into production from care and maintenance with the first year of 4 million pounds. Uh, the second year back into full production, which is, I believe was 18 million pounds. Um, <clears throat> really, really big, substantial mine. But we need higher prices for that thing to come back. So I actually see if the market kind of goes into some normalized term contracting level within the next year, let's say, I think that we could see a steady rise into the 40 to 50 range with some consolidation. So I believe that that could happen because we have Cameco with MacArthur River and Cigar, and we have Kazadam Prom Uranium One, Orono with Kazakhstan production. All would be very happy, in my opinion, with prices at that level, signing contracts with prices at that level. Now that has a limited amount of production available, uh, but it's a big chunk. So we could have a good contracting cycle begin, and let's say a third of that total demand uh, by utilities could be soaked up into these, these major players that we could consolidate for a period of time. That could be a year, that could be maybe one to two years, kind of in that range. But that production does not fulfill all of the needs of the global utilities, not even close. So I think that utilities will get what they can in that price environment, followed by uh, the next step up which would be into the into the 60 to $80 range, which is really what's needed um, to bring much more production online and to enable, uh, to be able to fulfill the demands of the utilities beyond what kind of the big players might be able to fulfill in that 40 to 60 range. And to your point, um, you're absolutely right regarding costs, you know? I mean, you have a cash cost, which is just the basic cost of production, the all in sustaining, which takes in some more considerations regarding capital expenditures, uh, GNA costs, et cetera. And then the fully allocated cost is really what we is really what we need to see in order to incentivize new greenfield projects to come online. And the fully allocated cost takes in everything it takes in debt, GNA costs, capital expenditures, um, uh, you know, any sort of write downs that the companies had to make over the years. Uh, all of these costs that these companies have had to float and carry for years of sitting idle um, need to be included in the cost of, of, of creating and building a new mine. And so that's sort of, that's, that's my one scenario I'm looking at. Uh, another scenario is the utilities just hold out and hold out and hold out, get what they can in the spot market, uh, get what they can carry trades. The spot market kind of ticks up into the $40 range. And then I think if we don't see contracting incentivize the care and maintenance mine to come back, then I see, we, I think we see a price spike. So without getting too specific, I do think uh, we're probably looking at mid thirties by the end of the year would be my guess. Forties in 2021 is my guess. Um, and then beyond that really depends on how the utilities act. So if they sit on their hands for another 12 months, I think we see a big price spike. Um, if they start to, uh, if they start to contract to incentivize the care and maintenance stuff to come back online, then I think that we could see a more 
gentle um, rise with potential for a consolidation in that in that 40 to 60 range. Okay, good stuff. Um, so we've been going at this for about an hour. I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about your um, newsletter product. I know um, it's got a lot of traction. You've got a lot of uh, a lot of time on different interviews and videos, and just kind of wanted you to talk about that and, and the kind of the growth in that and what what the what the offer is and 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 what people can expect if they uh, subscribe. Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've been writing the newsletter for a little over a year. Um, it's it's really uh, grown the past few months because primarily because the uranium market has picked up. But um, we've really really uh, been been improving our offer. Um, I've I've hired some help, uh, very very smart people um, helping with contributions of content, and I'm I'm really excited. We're basically we're hyper focused on the uranium market. Um, and we've had some really, really good wins this year. We've been able to essentially pick um, amongst our stock recommendations to members uh, a few of the of the top performers. So recently, just kind of crunching the data since the newsletter began, um, our our portfolio is up about 53% relative to the spot price, growing at 18%, and and the quote unquote market, let's say URA, um, just up a few percentage points. So we've done a good job of outperforming the market in what could mostly be described as sort of a uh, a flat um, 12 months from from this point last year. But yeah, so our offer we put out a really comprehensive monthly email, and then we have a number of bulletins that we issue throughout the month, depending on news flow, depending on on company developments. Um, but it's uh, like I said, we're we're hyper focused on this industry, and and the intention is to obviously um, dig up and and find and recommend uh, the companies within the sector that offer what we believe is the best return on investment, but also to keep abreast of of the macro situation and to keep our members informed of of, of what the heck's going on in this industry because it's very complex, it's very complicated. And um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to to keep on top of this and to distill it down into something that's easy to understand and helps our members to take action um, in in the market and and to and to trade or or invest accordingly. So so far we have a really fantastic track record um, with our picks. We've had some really big winners. Um, three of our picks have gone up two to three x. Um, in less than two months, which has been fantastic. We've had some great profit taking already. Um, and uh, yeah, the newsletter, so it's uh, $400 for the year. And um, that's that's what you get. You get that monthly comprehensive uh, email that's very deep and very detailed. And uh, we update our stock picks every uh, every three months. We call a focus list. We keep our investments to 10 companies. And we're very critical of the companies in the space, and only certain companies make it into that list, obviously. Um, so yeah, it's and we're going to keep going on that route. Um, it's looking really positive for the next uh, for the next year uh, and out into the future. So um, knock on wood, good things are coming, and we will do our best to to keep our members informed of everything macro and, and continue to try to pick out the best investments. All right. Outstanding. So um, if people want to follow you, I know you're on Twitter quite a bit uh, at um, Uranium Insider. Uh, how else uh, can people get a hold of you or follow your work? Uh, Twitter is great. Um, I, I'm pretty active on Twitter. I'm very accessible on Twitter. You can direct message me there. Um, our website is uraniuminsider.com. We have a contact there, uraniuminsider at gmail.com. Um, I, I always do my best to respond as quickly as I can and try to remain as accessible as possible. Um, so anyone interested can feel free to hit me up um, through any of those means. All right. Good stuff, uh, Justin. Appreciate uh, your time today. And uh, hopefully uh, the things we've talked about will resonate with uh, folks. And um, hopefully uh, they'll take advantage of uh, your offerings. 
So uh, appreciate you coming on, and um, hopefully we'll have you on uh, maybe uh, in another six months or a year for an update. I look forward to it, John. Thanks again. Uh, always, always enjoyable to chat with you. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thanks. Bye.